Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Hello and welcome to our Tuesday Night Live Bible Study. I'm glad that you've joined me. I'm Andrew Womack and I've got Julianne Harris here as our host. We've been having a great time before we came on the air. I'm trying to straighten her out. And, yes. Uh, you know, Nearly all things are possible. I'm well, you sure can't teach old dogs new tricks. So, are you calling yourself a dog? No. I'm not uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we've been having a good time. Yeah, I'm going to share some things with you in the Word tonight that I believe will really bless you. I've been studying in John 14, 15, and 16, and on television, I've been teaching a brand new series that I've called Jesus Farewell Address. And uh, so that's what I'm teaching on television. I've been studying this a lot, and I'm going to share some things tonight about Jesus being the vine and us being the branches. And I've been trying to get Julianne to understand <laughs> this, and she's halfway there. So we'll see. anyway, hopefully this will help tonight. So hopefully. Ju Julianne's going to share with you some things about how you can get involved and ask questions. And we've also got meetings coming up, things like that. Yes. So this is an interactive Bible study. We want you to interact with us. How you can do that is in whatever forum you are watching, we want you to type in your questions as Andrew shares, and then the last 10 to 15 minutes, we're going to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. Now, in order for you to interact with us, you know we have these Bible studies five days a week, but you must tune in while we're live. So let me go over the schedule right quick. So on Mondays and Fridays, we have Bible study at 10 a.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays is at 6 p.m. and Wednesday morning is at 7 a.m. and that is all mountain time. So tune in while we're live and interact with us. Now, Tuesday nights are really cool in the fact that we offer you Tuesday night live Bible study notes. But you have to sign up for them. So here's how you do it. You go to awmi.net slash study. You're going to enter in your information there. And then the following Monday, you're going to get tonight's Bible study notes. And that will happen every single Monday following those Tuesday night live Bible studies. So it's really special. But the first time you sign up to receive those notes, you are entered into a drawing for a product. Now, please keep in mind, every product that we do on uh, Tuesday night, you can purchase it as well. So don't feel like, oh, I missed out. No, you can just purchase it. And so tonight we are giving away a Sure Foundation. It's an autographed copy uh, by Andrew. And so amazing book. Uh, it's one of our first courses that you take by Andrew in Karis Bible College. It's absolutely phenomenal. So I would encourage you, if you're not able to enter into the drawing, you should purchase this book. So go to awmi.net slash study and sign up for those Bible study notes. Now, last week we gave away three products by Alex, Alex McFarland. And so let me uh, read you the winners. So we had, let's see here, uh, Car Carlos Connor III. We had Tim Collar and then Jim Knopp. <laughs> I probably totally butchered all of your names, and I'm sorry for that. But our people will be reaching out to you to get you those products from Alec Mc McFarland. <laughs> I try to go so fast. <laughs> I lose track. Okay, so next we have upcoming events, you guys. We have on May the 3rd, it's Friday night, it is Truth and Liberty Banquet. You guys, you don't want to miss out on this. It is a fundraiser for Truth and Liberty. And if you guys are not watching Truth and Liberty every day of the week at 3.30, from 3.30 to 5, I would encourage you to do so. And you can be a part of it by coming to this banquet. And who's going to be at the banquet? Uh, Hailey, hey, Riley Gaines. She's yeah. the swimmer. Yeah. Um, uh, who else? Pat Bradley. Pat Bradley. And Joe Kennedy. And Joe Kennedy. And these are awesome people, and I tell you, it's really going to be good. This is also a fundraiser, mm -hmm. and if people can't come, uh, we do have uh, so that you can uh, sponsor an entire table and things like that Correct. because it is a fundraiser, and we need people to help us with Truth and Liberty. Correct. So um, I'm sure that we will put the information up on your screen of where you can go for that. Um, it would be Truth and Liberty. So uh, that's coming up. Then we have year three graduation. And then let's see what else did they want me to mention. Summer Family Bible Conference. That's the conference for your entire family. That will be in the beginning of July, the very first week of July. Also, we are doing two productions of In God We Trust. Yep. That's going to be amazing. There's a lot on the schedule for that week. So check that out. Go to awmi.net slash events and sign up and make sure and try to be here on campus. 
Also, two last things. You can be a part of everything this ministry is doing by becoming a partner. You guys, there is nothing, um, there's nothing easier. God has made it so easy that when you partner with something, you get to reap the benefits of the fruit. And that's how you can do it with this ministry. So I would encourage you to pray about becoming a partner. You can go to awmi.net slash give or give us a call at 719-635-1111. And last but not least, we have prayer ministers available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you are going through something, maybe you wanna know what the word says about what you're going through. Maybe you want supplemental teaching. I would encourage you to call our prayer ministers today at 719-635-1111. They are there 24-7. So I don't think it. you mentioned The Cure, but I'm going to be speaking at The Cure next no, Thursday, not. Friday, and Saturday. Not this coming Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, but the next. Yep. And that's with uh, Ashley and Carly Teradez. And man, that's really good. They, they are awesome. Yeah. So what I want to share with you tonight is from John chapter 15. And like I said, I've been teaching on this on television and I've got a new series that is coming out. It's got a little book on it. And what we've done is take my footnotes from my living commentary on these three chapters. And it's about a hundred and I think it's a hundred page book or something like that, where I've just taken the digital copy of my living commentary and we put it in printed form. And uh, I've reviewed it and looked through it, and it's really, really powerful. But uh, I want to share from John chapter 15. This is right in the middle of what Jesus was saying to his disciples. And it says in John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. You know, by the fact that he said, I am the true vine, means that there must be false vines. And, or you could say it this way, that he's not the only vine. Here's another way of saying it, that every one of us is plugged into something. You know, we have these sayings and people will say, I'm a self-made man or I'm a self-made woman. The truth is nobody is a self-made anything. You are either letting God live through you and you are reflecting his life in you or you are letting the world flow through you, which is the devil. You know, anything that's not God is ultimately comes back to the devil. Even if it's relatively moral, even if it's okay, uh, man, it'll send you to hell if you're just plugged into this world and using those things. So the truth is, everybody is just a branch of something. You are plugged into something, and the sad fact is many of us are plugged into the world. But a Christian, it says that Jesus is the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So again, we are just the branch, and the branch is just attached to the vine, and the life that's in the vine, the vine draws all this nourishment out of the ground and puts it through the branch to the uh, fruit that grows out on the branch, and it just flows through us. And it says, every branch that doesn't bring forth fruit, he takes away. And every branch that brings forth fruit, he purges it so that it might produce more fruit. You know, I'm not going to take time to go into all of this, but right here you see a progression. He says that God wants you to have fruit, and then he will purge you so that you will have more fruit. And then as you continue on, he says, these things have I spoken unto you that she could have much fruit. Hmm. So there is a growth process. There's fruit, more fruit, and then much fruit. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, there's the good, then the acceptable, then the perfect will of God. Mark chapter 4, verse 28, there's first a blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. So you see this uh, all the way through the things that the Word of God teaches, that there's a growth process Amen. to the Christian life. And so when it says that he purges us, I just want to spend a few moments talking about this. I don't want to get stuck here, but I was raised that the way that you get purged is God puts sickness on you. He puts uh, poverty in your life. He'll call your marriage, cause your marriage to fall apart. All of the tragedies and the hurts and the heartaches that we have is God pruning us. That is not true because in the very next verse, he had just said in the last part of this second verse, every branch in me that brings forth fruit, he purges it. And then in verse 3, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. If you look this word clean up in the Greek right here, it means to purge. 
And so the way he purges you in the context right here, you got to remember that people are the ones that put the verse numbers in there. There's nothing wrong with that. That helps us to reference where we are and things like that. But it doesn't mean that it's a new concept or that it's a disjointed statement. He just said that every branch in him that brings forth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. And then he says, now you are clean or purged through the word that I've spoken unto you. God doesn't purge us. He doesn't prune us by all of the hardships that are in our life. And I tell you, this is very, very important that you understand this. Because again, I was raised that God is one that's the source of all of these things. And what that does, that makes you submit mm -hmm. to all of your problems thinking, well, this is God. God must have put this. I've got to learn the lesson. God's trying to teach me something through me being sick. And yet the scripture says in James chapter 4, verse 7, that you have to submit to God and then you have to resist the devil. Amen. And so there's a clear distinction. Not everything is of God. There's things that are from God that you submit to. There are things from the devil that you, sub that you resist. And like uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So the scripture says that sickness is of the devil. You have to resist those things. And if you have been under this false teaching where you submit to your problems thinking this is God trying to break you and humble you, well, then you're going to wind up submitting to the devil and you're going to allow him to have free reign in your life. Now, this brings up another question. And some people say, oh, so, so you don't need the correction. You don't need to learn anything. You don't need to be purged. No, we all need to be purged. We all need, we got things in our life that need to be cut out, but how do you do it? It's through the Word. Amen. You know, let me use this passage of Scripture from 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3, and in verse 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So this says that the Word of God is what reproves you and corrects you. And the next verse, verse 17, says it will make you perfect. A person that says that you can't be mature without having hardships, God puts hardships, trouble in your life to purge you and to make you better, well, then those people will say, if you don't ever have any problems in your life, then you can't be perfect. This says that you can be made perfect through the correction and the reproof of the Word, and that goes along perfectly with what Jesus said right here. So some of you, this isn't an issue because you haven't been taught that. But I was taught that it was God that killed my father. It was God that put trouble in my life and things like that. And when you believe that kind of stuff, then all you do is just give a token resistance to any problems in your life because you never know. It could be God that is putting this on you to teach you something and you can't really resist. You know, as it says in James 4, 7, resist the devil, that word resist there means to actively fight against. It's not passive. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. That's talking about that there is a godly type of anger. You've got to hate sickness. You've got to hate sin. You've got to hate the devil and all of the things that he does. And you got to resist him with everything you've got, hatred towards these things. And if you believe that God is in control of the negative things that happen in your life, then you can't hate those things if you think God is behind them because that way you would be fighting against God. You would be hating God. I can say this with conviction because I've been there. You know, I've told you before that I brought back a teaching where uh, this guy said that Satan is God's messenger boy and anything that negative is happening. It's like the devil is on a dog on a leash and he can only go as far as God lets him go. So if Satan is fighting you, it's God that sicked him on you and it's God that has allowed this and you've got to submit to it. And because I believe that, because I brought this teaching back, a girl that I was engaged to, she listened to that and she prayed and asked God to give her problems, to give her a cancer so that she could glorify God and she died from it. And I've seen that this is a deadly doctrine. And boy, that is not what this is teaching. Yes, God purges us. Yes, God trims off from us all of the ungodly things that don't need to be in our life. But he does it through the word of God. 
Amen. Somebody says, well, what about the people that aren't listening to the Word of God? Well, then you can let hard knocks teach you that <laughs> there's a better way. Amen. Amen. And the better way is to take the Word of God and let the Word of God change your life. And then he says in verse 4, he says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Boy, there's a lot of things here that I just haven't got time to expound on completely. But you know, he says, I'm in you, and you are in me. Now, how can that happen? You know, if this was me, and you put something in me, well, then how could that be in me, and yet I be in it at the same time? I think an example of this is like a vine and a branch. The branch is in the vine. It's, it's uh, connected to that vine, and yet the vine is flowing through that branch to bring all of these nutrients out to the fruit that you want to do. So that's kind of an example of it. That's exactly what he's using here. And he said that you have to abide in me. Boy, this is one of the biggest mistakes that people in the body of Christ make. They don't seek God all of the time with their whole heart. They seek the Lord in spurts. They have a part of their life that this is my sports life. This is my recreation life. This is my uh, reading you know, life. They may like to read these old cheap dime novels or something where people are having sexual relationships. And you know it's not what the Word says, but you just love the suspense and stuff. And so you have parts of your life that you don't invite God into. You know, there's a song that I heard one time about a guy who uh, he was talking about the Lord coming and the Lord wanted to go into every part of his life and he was going through his life and then he saw this door and he said, oh, I never go in there. I don't open that. And he wouldn't let the Lord in that part of his life. And finally, he surrendered and let the Lord in and God cleansed him all, all, of all of that. But if you could imagine your life being like a house, do you let the Lord into all of your house or do you just let him in the living room and then you have your own private parts where you do things that are different? Hmm. That's not abiding in the Lord. The word abide means it's a fixed position. It's not something that you just visit. The Bible says that the just live by faith. They don't visit there. It's not where they vacation. It's not where they go on weekends for one hour to church. It's not where you have just a devotion. You know, I'm not against devotions, but a devotion shouldn't be where you spend this amount of time, 30 minutes or whatever, focused on the Lord, and then the rest of the day is yours, and you just go your way and forget all of those things. Amen. You have to abide in the vine. It needs to be a fixed position. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 says, The Lord will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon him, because he trusteth in him. It's talking about that you have to stay your mind upon the Lord. In uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, if you then are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things on above and not on things of the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. We need to abide in faith. We need to abide in our relationship with the Lord. And I know that there's some people thinking, you can't do that. I got to go to work. You're a preacher. You can just keep your mind on the Lord all day long. Nothing ever, you know, <laughs> that's totally a misunderstanding of what's going on. But nonetheless, there's some people that think, well, you're a preacher, but I got to go out and make a living. And I can't do that. Did you know you can keep your mind stayed on God all of the time? Amen. Here's an example of this. That I know every one of you at some time or another has had something happen You've had a physical problem or you've had a relational problem with your mate or with your kids or you're worried about your finances or something and you can go to work and you do your job and yet all day long <laughs> your mind is focused on whatever so that true. problem is. You're, you've taken care about it and you're worried about it. Did you know the same part of you that worries is the same part of you that meditates? Mm -hmm. All worry is is meditation on something negative. If you can go to work and keep your mind on something negative all day long, you can also go to work and keep your mind stayed on the Lord. And you can do your job and you'll do it better. Because if you're in tune with the Lord, God will just quicken your uh, mental abilities, your physical abilities. You'll do everything better. So you can keep your mind stayed on the Lord. This says that you have to abide in Him. You cannot bear fruit 
of yourself, except you abide in the vine. And the very next verse says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Really simple theology. You aren't the vine. You are the branch. That means that you don't bring forth fruit. It is not your ability. The only thing that makes you fruitful is the way that you abide in the Lord. It is not your personality. It's not your anything. It's who you are in the Spirit hooked into the Lord. This is what we were talking about before the Bible study tonight. And it's your position in Christ that causes His life to flow through you. Yeah. And did you know that there's just a lot of people that honestly think that they're awesome? And you just think that, man, I am an awesome person and I don't need as much help as Julianne does. I just need a little bit of help. She needs a lot of help, but I need a little bit of help because I'm really an awesome person. You aren't abiding in the vine. You are thinking that it's your source, that you're the source of all of that nutrients that's flowing through you. But the truth is, it's like Paul said, without, well, it's like Jesus said right here. He says, without me, you can do nothing, is what the rest of this verse goes on to say. You need to recognize that if you take a branch and you detach it from the vine, that branch is absolutely useless. Mm -hmm. Now, the branch is an extension of that vine, and in that sense, it's awesome. But did you know what? Its only fruitfulness is, is its connection to the vine. And if you ever get to thinking that, God, I'm awesome. No wonder you chose me, and uh, I'm just going to go bear fruit for you. I'm going to do it through my personality, through the gifts, the talents, all of the things that you've given me. You have just detached yourself from the vine, and you are going to try and do things on your own. And let me just say to you that this is why some of you are so frustrated is because you think that it's up to you and you are going out and trying to do something for the Lord and asking God's blessing on what you're doing. A better way is just to have no purpose, no uh, vision for your life at all. Your only vision is to just abide in the vine and then whatever God wants to flow through you and whatever He wants to do, you're there at His disposal. But so many people have got their own agenda, their own vision, and they're trying to get God to bless it and I tell you, that's a recipe for frustration. That's a recipe for getting burned out. And that is not the way that God does it. You, you need to recognize abiding in the vine is your superpower. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> we were talking about all of this. <laughs> but honestly, though, Andrew, like the vine enjoys the branch, well, even yeah, though the, the vine, vine is the supply. The vine the needs a branch. You could say it that way. Right. The vine can't produce without the branch. Right. But the vine is the source of everything. Absolutely. And uh, anyway, we were joking because Julianne <laughs> in front of what? A thousand people asked me what my superpower was. <laughs> There's I don't context have a, to it. I don't have a superpower. Well, my only superpower is abiding in the vine, and it's amen. God's life it's that flows through me. I don't have any power. I don't have any natural abilities just on my own. Everything I've got is the Lord. You know, let me do it this way. I've had people ask me, say, well, what is your vision? And, you know, I've thought a lot about it, and the Lord has shown me that I need to build out Karis Bible College. He's shown me to have a, a worldwide ministry television. He's shown me to uh, produce the Bible College. But I didn't ask for one of those things. Matter of fact, I used to ask and pray against having a Bible College because I knew how much effort it was, and I'd seen people that had graduated from other people's Bible College that were an absolute mess, and I didn't want my name associated with them. So this wasn't something that I wanted and I asked God, oh God, please let me start a Bible college. Oh God, please let me go on television. I didn't ask for any of that. Did you know my only vision, my only goal in life really is to abide in the vine. And then whatever God wants to flow through me, whatever fruit that produces, I started Karis Bible College because the Lord told me to. I started on television because the Lord told me to. I started putting out materials because the Lord told me to. I honestly haven't had any uh, goals in life other than just to know the Lord. And did you know that this goes contrary to what a lot of people in the body of Christ teach? 
And a lot of people will say, what do you want to do? Just go out. Well, if you're seeking the Lord with your whole heart, Psalms chapter 37, verse 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. So if you are really delighting yourself in the Lord, it's true that He will put His desires in your heart and you can do what you want to do. But just to say that, you know, what is it that you want to do? And just go for it and ask God to bless it. That's a wrong thing. That would be like taking a, a branch out of the vine and say, you go out there and just bear fruit. It doesn't work that way. It's only your connection to the vine that allows you to have his supernatural life flow through you. Now, there are some people that are much, much, much more talented than I am, and you in your own ability might be able to go out and like sing and just, you know, I, I can't say that, who's this, uh, Taylor, somebody a singer? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, I guess. I don't know all these names. But anyway, she may have a natural talent, and boy, I guess she's super successful and making lots of money, but that doesn't mean that that's God flowing through her. I doubt very seriously that it's God flowing through her from what I've heard. And so there are some people that have talents, and you might be able to succeed and do some things on your own, but you won't have the life of God flowing through you when you are just taking your own natural talents and abilities and doing it and asking God to bless it. So you, you need to be plugged into the vine. He says, without me, you can do nothing. You need to come to a place to where you just literally come to the end of yourself, run up a white flag and say, God, without you, I'm absolutely nothing. I can do nothing. That's what Jesus said. But then you also need to recognize that when you are plugged into the vine, you were never without him. Yeah. He said he'd never leave you nor forsake you. So there's a ditch on both sides of the road. I often use this comparison, but if you're going down a dirt road, there's a drainage ditch on both sides of the road. If you start to hit one, the tendency is to overcorrect and turn the wheel so far that you hit the ditch on the other side of the road. Either ditch will keep you from getting where you need to go. So you got to learn how to go down the middle. And so there is a truth that without Jesus, I am nothing and I can do nothing. But then there's also a ditch on the other side that you get to where you just think, well, you know, I can do anything on my own. You need a balance between this, that without him, I can do nothing, but I'm never without him. So through Christ, I can do all things. Uh, Philippians chapter four, verse 13. And so there is a balance between these two things. This is really important though, that you get to a place to where you just come to the end of yourself and that's where you'll find the beginning of God. You know, I had Mike Pickett, who's our uh, executive vice president, and we were talking about some things, and I was telling him that he needed to come up higher, and he needed to start having more of this 30,000-foot view where he oversees things instead of doing it all himself. And he was agreeing with that, and he... And he was, I was talking to him about you need to raise up people and delegate some of the things you're doing to them so that you can oversee and, and things. And anyway, he agreed with it. And then he asked me, he says, how is it that you can delegate so much stuff to all of these other people? Because I only deal with five people in the ministry and they're the ones that run everything else. And he says, how is it that you can do that? Why, why can you delegate so easily? And I told him, I said, I think that the reason I can do it so easily is because I don't have an exalted opinion of myself. And most people in my ministry can actually do things as well or better than I can. And so it's easy for me to delegate. But a person who just feels like they're God's gift to mankind and that nobody can do anything as well as I do, it's hard to turn things over to people. So you need to come to this place to where you find your sweet spot is being hooked into the vine, staying tuned into him, and you just let the life of God flow through you. And so this is a heart attitude. It also involves time. You can't just have quality time. You have to have quantity time where you stay in the presence of God and keep your mind stayed upon God. And wherever you focus your attention, that's what's going to dominate you. And if you focus your attention on Jesus, the vine, and if that's what you are, if you are constantly aware that without him, you can do nothing. And so you've got to stay connected to him. I guarantee you, you'll start seeing the supernatural life of God flow through you and the end results will be fruit. That's what he said. He wants you to bear much, much fruit. Amen. Amen. So those are good. That was good. That was good. We'll continue our conversation later. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's it's helping, but I her, I got some her good points. Her superpower is mm -hmm. stubbornness. It's stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> she just will not let go. Amen. Amen. Are you ready for some questions already? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, sir. Okay, so Sophia on chat says, when Jesus says he wants his word to abide in us, does this include the Old Testament? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the Bible says, I quoted that verse already in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So it's not just the New Testament, it's the Old Testament. Now you have to understand the Old Testament in the light, light of the New Testament. We aren't under that covenant anymore, but there was nothing wrong with that covenant the only thing that was wrong with the old covenant was that it gave a standard of perfection and none of us are perfect. Right. And so you got to crawl out from under the do's and the don'ts and the mm -hmm. condemnation and the judgment of the Old Testament and recognize that all of your failure to meet those things have now been placed upon Jesus. And through Jesus, we get all of the blessings of the Old Testament and through Jesus, all of the curses of the Old Testament have been taken away. So you have to read it in light of the New Testament. but. I spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. Amen. Amen. It's good. Um, so if we have several things in our lives that could be things God is directing us to do, how do we tell which one to follow? You have to set priorities for one thing. Uh, you know, right now I've got, I guess you could, uh, I just look at it as I'm following God, but there's many things he's told me to do. He's told me to have a television ministry. He told me to have a Bible college. And then he's told me that I've got to build this, these things out. He's telling me to start a, a television network. And so I've got multiple things that we're doing. And uh, right now we're in a financial crunch. And I personally believe that God's taking care of everything. I don't have any problems with this, but some of my staff is getting a little stretched <laughs> and they're coming to me about, man, uh, you know, we don't have many reserves. And so for their sake, I told them, all right, here's my priorities. Here's what I want to get done absolutely for sure. And if we have any shortage in money, then this would be my second, third. Yeah. And I do that for the sake of other people. But personally, I believe that everything God told me is coming to pass and Amen. it's okay. But uh, so you have to set priorities. Is the way you Amen. Do. And I think, but you have one ultimate vision that it all feeds to. Absolutely. So I don't think God's going to give you different visions. Your vision is to take the gospel. But there's multiple ways of accomplishing it. Right. But it should all feed into that yes, vision. Absolutely. That and, and that's something that you have to make sure. You know, when you don't have many resources and stuff, you, there's not very many things you can do, yeah. and so you're limited. But when right now we're just blessed, and God has blessed us, and we have a cash flow that I could do a lot of things. Yeah. And I have to make sure that just because it's good doesn't mean it's God. I have to stay focused on what God's called me to do. Amen. Amen. Okay, so when Jesus arose from the dead, was the whole world raised as well for just those whom the Father knew would accept Jesus? or just those? I would say this, that when Jesus died for our sins, the sins of the whole world were paid for. First John chapter two, verse two says, he is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So the sins of the whole world were paid for. You have to access that grace through faith is what it says in Romans chapter five, verse two. So even though the sins of the whole world were paid for, not everybody's sins are forgiven because you have to accept it by faith. But as far as being raised from the dead, no, the unbelievers haven't been raised from the dead, but every true believer, every person who receives salvation has resurrection life in them. And according to Romans chapter six, you've been raised from the dead. But then Romans chapter six also says that you have to reckon yourself to be dead, but also alive. So it's been purchased, it's been accomplished, but it has to be appropriated. Mm. It's not automatic. That's really good. Um, so Tan has a great question. Tan on YouTube says, if I'm already in Christ, isn't abiding natural? Well, um, no, mm. not what he's saying right here. I believe that you being in Christ is automatic, but him being in you and flowing through you, you can detach yourself from him. You can take your mind off of the Lord. You can get to where you're living in sin. Romans chapter six, verse 16 says, know ye not that to whom yield your, you yield yourselves to, whether of sin unto death 
or of obedience unto righteousness. I misquoted that. To whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So even though you are born again and Christ is in you, you aren't necessarily abiding in him unless you are yielding yourself to him. You go out and yield yourself to sin and you're allowing Satan to come in to steal, kill, and destroy. So... Yes, we are in Him in the sense that we are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we become a new creature. But we aren't abiding in Him unless we are following Him and yielding to Him. If we are living in disobedience, you are detaching yourself from the vine and you aren't going to have His life flow through you. That's really good. Jewel on YouTube says, How would you bring the truth of God's victory and goodness to someone who believes and teaches God uses bad things or the devil to teach them something? Well, if they would read the Bible, it would teach them differently. Yeah. For instance, the uh, children of Israel coming out of the land of Egypt, it makes it very clear that God wanted them to go into the promised right. land in the 13th right. chapter of the book of Numbers. And yet the spies came, and came back saying they're giants. And we were like grasshoppers in their sight. And because of that, they rebelled at God and it didn't please God. And then it's commented on in Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4, and it shows you it was their unbelief that kept them out of there, not God's perfect will. And uh, Psalms chapter 78 verse 41 says, In their heart they turned back and limited the Holy One of Israel. So that right there shows you that you can limit what God wants to do in your life. Another verse is Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. That says that God has to flow through the power that's working in us. That's faith and love and things like that. If you get into bitterness and unforgiveness and things like that, that will limit what God can do. So if a person would read the Bible, <laughs> they would get free of this extreme sovereignty doctrine. And the few scriptures that even look like they are teaching that God just sovereignly moves in your life, like Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it says, we know that all things work together for good. If you take that scripture in its context, it starts with a preposition that links it to the previous verses about the Holy Spirit making intercession for you. If that's not happening, then things won't work together for good. And it didn't say that all things come from God. It just said that God could work it together for good. And then there's two other qualifications in that verse. It says, for those who love God. Amen. If you don't love God, it's not going to work together for good. And if you aren't called according to His purpose, which his purpose in uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 is to destroy the works of the devil. So that's talking about a person who's flowing in his purpose, which is to resist the devil Amen. and fight against the devil. So anyway, you can take any scripture that people would misuse and talk about that. And if you really study it, I guarantee it, it does not teach that God controls everything that happens in your life. Amen. That's I happen to have some teaching on that, a lot of teaching on that. <laughs> yeah, yes, you do. <laughs> uh, so we have a great question from Gigi. It says, why does Jesus advocate for us at the right hand if we are forgiven already by his blood? Well, because the forgiveness is a done deal. He's forgiven all of your sins, past, present, and future. Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 says that. But he is there continually making intercession for us because we do dumb stuff. Mm. And again, Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, To whom ye yield yourself, servants to obey, his servants ye are. That doesn't mean that you lose your salvation, but you do give Satan an inroad into your life. And when you see that happening, you need to turn from that and, and confess and agree with the Lord that, God, you were right, I was wrong. And by doing that, you take away Satan's right, and God intercedes for you, and he stands against the devil. But you have to cooperate with him, and when you do repent like that, well, then he stands there on your part interceding for you. It's not forgiveness in the sense that it affects your eternal relationship with God, but it does affect Satan's inroad into your life. And if you sin, you need to confess it and get out of that. Amen. Amen. So good. Uh, Carol on chat says, what are ways to meditate on the Word? And I just taught on this today in uh, Psalms chapter 1, verse 2. It says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law doth He meditate day and night. And the exact same Hebrew word that is translated meditate in Psalms 1, 2 is translated imagine in Psalms chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine 
a vain thing. So just looking at the way that that one Hebrew word is translated, it's translated meditate, and it's also translated imagination, which shows you that to meditate, you have to use your imagination. So you take a scripture, for instance, like by his stripes we were healed, 1 Peter 2, 24, the last part of that verse. And it's one thing to read it, but then you have to take that truth and you have to meditate, imagine yourself already healed. Mm -hmm. And see, there's a lot of people that don't do this. They can quote Isaiah 53, 5, Matthew 8, 17, 1 Peter 2, 24. They can quote you the verses, but they have never seen themselves healed. Mm -hmm. Meditation is when you take the truths from God's Word, and it's not just information, but it's how you see yourself. It's the way you see yourself. Amen. And that's meditation. So good. So good. Happen to have some teaching on that one, too. <laughs> I got teaching on about everything. He has the teaching on, oh, so many subjects. It's amazing. So please don't hesitate to give our prayer ministers a call at 719-635-1111. And they have a whole database. So you can be like, well, Andrew mentioned a teaching on this. They can actually look That's it right. up and get it to That's you. Right. So it's absolutely powerful. And the Holy Spirit always steps in in those situations, too, and gets you exactly what you need. Amen. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, so how do you teach others who want to learn all about God, yet have a lot of excuses why they can't commit to God? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, the scripture says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So one of the things I would tell people is you ought to just try it for a while. Taste it. And you will see the goodness of God so much that it'll develop an appetite for it. That's one thing so you do. But then you also can take them to scriptures like over in 1 Peter chapter 2, where it talks about Peter and how that he dwelt among the people in Sodom and Gomorrah and in seeing and hearing their unlawful deeds, he vexed his righteous soul. And you can talk about how he lost his daughters, how he lost his wife, turned into a pillar of salt. So you can, you can encourage people to come by giving them a sample, telling them just to taste and see if it's good. You can also get them to come by warning them, this is what's going to happen if you continue to go the way you're doing and use scriptural examples and things like that. But uh, every person is individual and you just really need to listen to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit knows what those people need. Amen. So he can lead you exactly to where, what it is that would turn their heart around. Amen. Uh, so this is a great question from Angela. She says, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and when I'm praying over others, I've seen some healed and when, but when praying for my own healing, it doesn't feel the same, which sets me up for doubt. How do I overcome this? Well, Angela, the reason I think that happens, and I've been through this myself and I've seen it with a lot of other people, is that you love other people more than you love yourself. Or you could say it this way, that you know more bad things about yourself than you know about the other person. And so when you're praying for another person, you just feel the compassion of the Lord and you don't know all of the weird, dumb stuff that they've done. And so you just let this compassion lead you and the Bible says in Galatians 5, 6, that faith works by love. But when it comes to praying for yourself, you know every rotten thing about yourself that there is. You know every failure that you've made. And you tie your faith to your performance instead of to what Jesus did. If you were not thinking about, if you didn't, under, if you understood that it has nothing to do with your goodness, you're praying in the name of Jesus and you're getting it because of Jesus is, then you would have faith for yourself the way you have faith for other people when you don't know all the ways that they've messed up. I often tell people this. I say that if you knew me as well as you know you, then you wouldn't have any more faith in my prayers than you've gotten your prayers. But see, people see me and they see me on television and they see me at my best and they just think, uh, you know, I'm living holy all the time. Well, I'm Try, desiring to do it, but I don't do it perfectly. And it takes faith. And I have to exert more faith to pray for myself than I do to pray for other people because I don't know all the dumb stuff that they've done. I don't take that into, back, right. into uh, account. That's really good. Got time for one more question. Sure. Uh, Teresa on Facebook says, how do you explain to a Christian who believes drinking is not a sin because Jesus turned water into wine that it is wrong? How would you explain that since you've been through that more than I have? <laughs> a drinking is not a sin. To it's me. getting drunk. It's getting good. drunk. It's anything in excess is wrong. And it's, um, it's a deception. So it, 
talks about it in Proverbs, right? It's mm -hmm. like it starts with a little bit and then you get numb and then you end up in a wreck and it opens the door for the it enemy. It says it is like a person destroy. trying to go to sleep on top of a flagpole. Yep. You're going like, to fall. You're going to fall and you're going to wake up and your eyes are going to be bloodshot and you're going to say, let me do it again. Yeah. And so it's this vicious cycle plus it opens the door wide open for the enemy to come yeah. and steal, kill, and destroy. And personally, see, I've often used this example. If like here's a line and over there is sin and over here is living right, most people get as close to it as they can. Well, it's not a sin for me to drink. Right. Well, it's not. I've got friends that came from England right. and other places, and they will drink wine with a meal or something, and they love God, and God is using them in a powerful way. I don't have a problem with that. But I personally don't even take any kind of liquor. I've never right. tasted beer. I've never taken a drink of liquor, beer, anything in my entire life. And if this is the line and over here getting drunk is, is where I don't want to be, most people get as close as they can. It's like they're straddling the line. And if they get a little puff of wind, <laughs> it's going to blow them over. I get way over here so that I could trip and fall and not go across that line. <laughs> I'm never going to taste any liquor or wine or anything like that because there are some people that just respond negatively to that and they become alcoholics. They become addicted. I don't, I'm not ever going to have that happen. That's your superpower. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Anyway, we will continue this after we go off the air, but we appreciate you joining us. And let me just remind you that we do have people standing by on our phones right now, 719-635-1111. It's a 24 hour, seven day a week. Uh, prayer line. And as uh, Julianne said, if you've heard something and you say, well, do you have more teaching or do you have any ministry on this? They've got a database that they can type in a verse, they can type in a topic, and it'll bring up all of the books, tapes, CDs that I have on that. And it would be a real blessing to you. So check that out. They'll also pray with you and help you any way they can. Amen. Amen. So thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. God bless you. And we'll see you again for another live Bible study. Bye. I want to give you an opportunity to invest in people's lives. And that's what we're doing through our Karis Bible College. We are changing people's lives. And I mean, we are seeing total transformations. I just saw a couple of testimonies of some of our Bible College students. One of them, their daughter had died and this woman was thinking of killing herself. And it was because of Karis and what God did that changed her life around. Today, she's rejoicing and happy. We have another person that had PTSD and his body was hit by an IUD and he had all kinds of physical pains. He was considering suicide and he came to Karis. His life has changed. Another one that I saw was a drug addict that was dependent upon drugs and they actually came to school still taking the drugs and one day they forgot to bring their medication with them and, and they just decided I don't need it and today they're totally changed and working for us. We're seeing people's lives changed. And not only these individuals, but then they in turn go out and change other people. And I think that this is the only way we're ever gonna see this nation turned around is to start raising up champions, soldiers that'll go out and speak the truth. And so in order to fulfill the ministry to these students, we need more facilities, student housing, all kinds of things. And I'd encourage you to go to awmi.net slash campus and look at our artist rendering of what these buildings will be like. There's also a place there that you can sign up and become what we call a foundation builder. That's a person that gives on a monthly basis in order to help us build out this Karis Bible College campus. So check it out at awmi.net slash campus. And if the Lord speaks to you, join with us and become a foundation builder today. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.